I woke up and I couldn't get in to that door to get him because of the fire. And I tried to climb in the window and the neighbor pulled me out. I said, did you, did you find him? And he said, yeah, we, we found him. I just thought they're gonna have to take him to the hospital and he's gonna, he's gonna be treated for a burn. And, and I didn't think that my baby would be dead. The day after the fire, the Indiana Fire Marshal walked me and my father through the mobile home and said, I quote, this is where your sister poured gasoline. This is where she lit the match. And this is where she shut the door. The role of forensic science is to serve justice. I mean, that's why we got into this business. But we are asking things of the judicial system it was never designed or meant to do. Within the legal system, they vet information by what's called the adversarial system. So when I am presented as a witness for one side or the other, I'm part of the structure of the argument. If you're arrested, you might as well have done it, because they're going to get a conviction. A forensic odontologist testified that marks in the body matched my teeth, that those marks happened at the time of death, and that made me Ray Crone to murder. And I told that judge, you got the wrong person. I didn't do it. At which point, I was called an unremorseful killer, a monster, and said, I'll sentence you to death. What did your scientific test show? Take a look. Hey, uh, that microscope would only tell us who did it. I'm working on that. Most people are introduced to forensic science through TV and film. And because of this, we have come to see forensic techniques such as ballistics, footprint analysis, and bite mark identification as foolproof methods for solving crimes. But many forensic science techniques were not developed by scientists. They were developed in crime labs by law enforcement professionals who needed methods for testing available evidence. These techniques were often subjective and not run through the same kind of rigorous testing as traditional science. As exonerations increased due to a rise in DNA testing, it became clear that some forensic sciences had actually contributed to the wrongful convictions of innocent people. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. you. Welcome to Tennessee. Ray Crone. I'm glad to have you yeah, here. Yeah, glad to be. It's, so yeah, come on up to top here. It's an insane view here. Had to cut a few trees, but it was well worth it. <laughs> well, how long have you been out here in, on That's, this property? It's uh, six and a half years now we've been here in Tennessee. Moved down from Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Okay. So we really, really do enjoy it down here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like being, you know, out in the country. It's uh, it's that peace of mind, I guess, you need to, to be able to, to deal with some of the other stuff that, that life throws at you. In the early 90s, Ray Crone was living in Phoenix, Arizona, working as a mail carrier. On the morning of December 29, 1991, Kim Ancona was found sexually assaulted and stabbed to death on the floor of the men's room at a bar where she worked, a bar that Ray Crone frequented. When police heard that Kim had told a friend that Ray was going to help her close up that night, Ray became their prime suspect. So what was the forensic evidence that was used against you at that time? Mine was a bite mark. A forensic odontologist testified that marks in the body matched my teeth, that those marks happened at the time of death, and that made me Ray Crone to murder. But yeah, I was actually called the Snagger Tooth Killer in the newspapers. It was December 31st, 1991, New Year's Eve. Just got home from my day at the post office, just stepping out of my car in my driveway. All of a sudden, I heard the sound of screeching brakes, screaming, freeze, don't move, you're under arrest. I look over, it's a van load of police officers, full ride gear, guns drawn, bailed out of this van, black and whites pulling up, threw me on the ground, and arrested me for murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault, and Kim's death. This bite mark evidence, why was this the centerpiece of this case? I think two reasons. One, after they arrested me, that they had nothing else that they could try to attach to me. So it was uh, something that they could definitively look at and test. Uh, but it was also something that added to the heinousness, uh, uh, the, the horrible uh, outrage of, of the murder itself. 
So that bite mark was the thing that, not, that got the arrest warrant, that bite mark was the thing that, that got them to question me, and that bite mark was the thing that got them to convict me. Prosecutor introduced a videotape made by their bite mark expert uh, about a 45 minute rendition of how he matched my teeth and his latest techniques and technology and how he matched this perfectly to the, the wound on the victim's body. And that was a three and a half day trial of three hours to find me guilty. The jury was dismissed, the judge set the, the sentence and, and the prosecution puts on the first part where they argue why it's above and beyond the, the norm, why it deserves the death penalty, and they argue the bite mark was gratuitous violence, excessive pain and suffering, heinous and depraved, and you have to have one aggravating factor. And, and then it's time for the defense to put on the mitigating. Mitigating, of course, means to lessen, to abate, to ease, to soften, if you will. So I told him, you know, I said, I got nothing to mitigate. You got the wrong person. I didn't do it. At which point I was called an unremorseful killer, a monster, and said, I'll sentence you to death. In 1996, Ray was granted a retrial based on a technicality. During the trial, he was able to introduce his own experts who refuted the prosecution's interpretation that the bite marks on Kim's body matched Ray. Despite this, the jury returned another guilty verdict. For 10 years, Ray remained in prison for the murder of Kim Ancona until DNA analysis on previously untested saliva and blood found on Kim's body pointed in the direction of someone else as the killer. I came back with a match. Came back with a match to a man that was currently serving a sentence for having sexually assaulted a child just a few weeks or month after that murder. Uh, and a man who lived about four blocks away from the bar in Phoenix, Arizona. So I was released after 10 years, three months and eight days, and Kenneth Phillips was charged with the murder. There is no question of my innocence. Ray is one of hundreds of people to have been exonerated by DNA evidence. While DNA evidence is one of the most reliable forensic disciplines, others like bite mark analysis are far less definitive. But because judges have allowed prosecutors to use bite mark analysis as evidence before, it continues to be allowed in criminal trials. This is despite not having been subjected to scientific scrutiny and being ruled as unreliable by the wider scientific community. I think this distills the problem down to a very clear example where we know that the science has advanced and changed and our knowledge of how bite marks can and can't be used is different than it was 10 years ago. But because legal precedent exists that it was admitted, that's what's being used as a litmus test, not the scientific part. So, and that, that's the concern right there. I mean, scientific validity and legal precedent are not the same. Admissibility is not validity. So we set up crime scenes in here. Um, the painting. Mm -hmm. Every, at the end of every semester, we have to paint over all the blood stains batter. <laughs> and if you come in here with a light, yeah, because we, we use real human blood, and they'll start with very simple scenes and then work their way up to the end of the semester, a very complex scene. Forensics professor at West Virginia University, Dr. Suzanne Bell, says these are complex topics for judges and jurors, often with no scientific background, who are meant to decide cases. In 2009, a pivotal report was released that critiqued the forensic field's lack of oversight the different degrees of training required by experts, and the varying reliability of different disciplines, like bite mark identification. They recommended the creation of an independent government agency to address these issues. The Obama administration responded by creating a commission within the Department of Justice. One of the members of that commission was Dr. Bell. Who sat on the commission that was placed under the Obama administration? Uh, the commission was a wide-ranging group of people. We had representatives from forensic laboratories. We had prosecutors. We had defense attorneys, academic scientists, and police agencies. So it was a really eclectic group of stakeholders. I mean, it was very complete. Mm -hmm. The charter was to try to make recommendations for improving the practice of forensic science at the Department of Justice and then they would decide whether to implement those for the federal laboratories. Why was it so important to include independent scientists to that commission? I think that that was in response partially to the National Academy's report uh, about the importance of integrating academic scientists into a system that maybe they hadn't been as much integrated before, people that really understood how science was practiced outside of forensic science. And it brought a, a really important um, voice and because, you know, DNA science and things like that have advanced so far, it's important for that viewpoint to come in. Last year, in yet another instance of a reversal of Obama-era policies, 
Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced that he wouldn't renew the National Commission on Forensic Science, which was widely seen as a move to reduce the input of independent scientists. The idea that we need an independent scientific voice in this system is critical. And this just kind of perpetuates the system as it's been. And we know that the system as it's been has had problems. And I think it's, it is really time for us to, to clearly separate the role of the scientist from the role of the prosecutor, because we don't want the science to be tainted by the prosecution any more than we want it to be tainted by the defense. They have different motivations. They have different reasons. They will use the tools differently. So you actually wrote an article for Slate magazine where you said that science and law aren't natural partners. That is a common misconception that, that science and the law are both seeking truth and therefore that it's a perfect marriage of, of two disciplines, and, it, and it's really not. Within the legal system, they vet information by what's called the adversarial system. So prosecution and defense will make competing arguments. In science, we don't, we don't vet things that way. I mean, we, we, we have a process of vetting, we have testing, experimentation, replication, but within the legal system, it's competing arguments. So when I am presented as a witness for one side or the other, I'm part of the structure of the argument. One person whose case rested on the testimony of competing experts is Christine Bunch. Hi, Akil. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Nice to meet you. She was convicted of murder and arson after jurors sided with the state's fire experts over her defense's independent arson investigator. These were from the prison, actually. And I would hang on to them, but I was only allowed to have 50 pictures at a time. 21-year-old Christine was living in Decatur County, Indiana in 1995 when her mobile home caught fire in the early hours of the morning. Her three-year-old son, Tony, was sleeping inside. Christine was woken by the blaze, and when she couldn't get through the flames to rescue Tony, she ran to get help. A firefighter eventually pulled Tony from the house, but he was pronounced dead at the scene. Christine was later charged with his murder. It just doesn't, it doesn't penetrate your mind that something like that can happen and just wipe out everything. When I was first arrested, I thought, you know, the law's gonna be on my side, I'm innocent. And when people say that and they tell the truth, it works out the way it's supposed to. Before the trial, I, I wasn't in um, a real good place. I started getting sick and decided I needed to go to the doctor. That's when I discovered I was pregnant with Trent. That was the moment that I realized God hadn't turned his back on me by taking my child and he'd given me a second gift and I had to fight for it. Christine's case hinged on the state arson investigator's testimony that the presence of accelerants in the living room and the bedroom where her son Tony was sleeping proved the fire was intentionally set. To a jury sitting there, they've just heard, you know, the prosecution side say, oh yes, you know, this is what happened and it's an arson. And then they hear my investigator who's differing with him saying, oh no, this was an accidental fire which one are you gonna think is telling me the truth? If you grew up like I did, you expect the people that are hired and elected by your state to tell you the truth. So you're gonna side with the prosecution. You're gonna side with the state fire marshals because those are the people we expect to tell us the truth. When did you first hear about the forensic evidence being used against you? I heard about the ATF findings at trial. The, the little faint traces of kerosene that they found in the wood in the living room, I absolutely knew that was gonna be there. The previous owner had a kerosene heater in there. We had a kerosene heater in there. That makes sense. The, the other samples that they threw in in the living room and one in my son's bedroom, when that come out in trial, I think I was just, I was just in shock. Despite the defense's experts saying there was a probability the fire was accidental, 
Bunch was convicted and sentenced to 60 years in prison. That's my second child. Trent. Oh, that's Trent. Yeah, these are all Trent and Michael when he would come to visit. And we'd make little crafts and things. Michael, can you speak about the impacts that this false incarceration has had on your own life? Yeah, I was 17 years old. I was getting ready to start my senior year in high school. I quit school. I raised a kid. I worked three jobs for 15 years, and I made sure that he was there to see her every week. I had to do what I had to do to make sure that rent's paid, there's food on the table, and it, it was hard. It was hard, and it affects every aspect of my life, even to this day. In 2006, Christine's new lawyers subpoenaed ATF files from the original investigation. They found that the original report had been altered to show the presence of accelerants where they had not been found in Christine's home. These documents were not disclosed at her original trial. Her team also hired multiple independent experts to reinvestigate the evidence. What was presented was the unaltered document from ATF that said no accelerant had been found in my son's bedroom. And um, Jamie McAllister, she is um, a forensic toxicologist. She was able to take my son's autopsy report and determine cause of fire. Uh, and arson burns very hot, very fast, but Tony didn't die of thermal injuries or burns. He died of smoke inhalation. His blood got to an 80% carbon monoxide level. So in order for a fire to give off that amount of carbon monoxide, it has to be smoldering for a long time. That means that it's happening in the ceiling, in the wall, somewhere around some of those electrical components that we had been having problems with. So it's the first time I'd ever heard somebody explain this in such a precise way that any layperson could have followed. In 2012, on the basis of new expert testimony and the previously withheld ATF documents, Christine was granted a retrial and released. Four months later, the prosecution dropped all charges. The nap that is here it still feels really surreal. I just want to spend some time with my son. What's yeah. the first thing you'll do when you get home? <laughs> Probably disturb my son while I watch him do everything. <laughs> because I want to see everything he does. After learning about Christine's case in which she was incarcerated for almost my lifetime, it's clear that you cannot fathom what this person has been through. That's what I've actually felt throughout this entire process and in talking with people who've been falsely uh, incarcerated and who've been exonerated is that there's no excuse for not getting the science right and when it comes to that forensic science, there needs to be oversight when looking at how it's actually used in the judicial system. Well, I don't doubt the validity of the science. I doubt the credibility of the people that are testifying as forensic experts. I mean, how can you have two people testifying to the same set of evidence and come to a 180 degree different conclusion? If it's a science, a true science, then the same set of facts should lead each of them to the same conclusions. Science is moving so quickly. And the law is inherently slow. People who make the decisions or decide whether to use this evidence aren't scientists. That's where the system's kind of getting, we're at a crossroads, I think, in that we are asking things of the judicial system it was never designed or meant to do. People don't realize in the blink of an eye, something can happen and change your life. So sharing it, Let's people know that you need to appreciate the little everyday wonderful things. And I am one of those people that absolutely cannot accept that nothing good came from it. So if you share and somebody feels the pain and they understand and they recognize, hopefully the next person won't have to deal with that.